Reality TV is really exciting because you have no idea what's going to happen. That is Big Brother. All housemates to the lounge immediately. Don't do it. Please don't do it. We may have even begged a little bit. <laughs> ben, the tribe has spoken. I rang my mum and I said, get me out of here. I need to get out of here. Tracy, your starting weight is 109.8 kilos. I thought that one day someone was going to die on that show. The winner of The X Factor is... I crumbled big time. This is the beginning of the end. Yep, it was over. I don't know about you, but I love reality TV. And I'm not alone. Sport aside, reality shows have been the most or second most watched show every year since Big Brother first hit Aussie screens in 2001. The drama, the battles between the good guys and the villains, you know, those contestants we love to hate. They keep us watching. They don't seem real, but they are very real people with very real lives that continue long after the final weigh-in, rose ceremony or meal gets served to the judges. After you first meet someone, how long would it take you to, to decide, yep, they've got something? In probably about three seconds. And then they would have the first 30 seconds, if I'm feeling very generous, of what they say. I think when shows really work, they are a reflection of society without sounding like the Dalai Lama, because of course we are making reality TV shows. <laughs> I'm aware of that. But when they are very good, they question society and they make us think about ourselves. And I think that's what makes them very interesting. Marion Farrelly is what you'd call a master producer. She's overseen some of Australia's biggest reality shows. Farmer Wants a Wife, Celebrity Apprentice, even X Factor. I like that there is a social experiment angle to it. Yeah, on this particular year, we wanted them to sit around and have interesting conversations. Uh, so we built the house like this and we, and we put smart people uh, in there, which was uh, actually a dreadful mistake because smart people edit themselves and they think about the consequences of what they say. So they're um, generally quite terrible on reality shows. Before they go on my shows, I give them the talk of doom, as I like to call it. Uh, and I know it off by heart because I've said it so often. Uh, you will leave here and you will be too famous to go back to your job but not famous enough to be famous, so you probably won't work for two years. If you're a guy, people will want to fight you in the pub. If you're a girl, no one will want to date you. Everyone you have ever slept with will come forward and they will tell their stories to the press. And you think that you'll be the person on TV that everyone loves. But actually, when was the last time you were in a bar and you saw someone from TV and you went, oh my god, there's that idiot off the telly. Now you don't think the idiot will be you, but it probably will be. It has brought some positives. I think um, I probably would be morbidly obese if I hadn't got to that stage. Remember guys, the scales never lie. First person to weigh in is Tracy. It was quite nerve-wracking. I was quite ashamed. Um, I felt really ashamed of the way I had got to that point of, of the number that I had got, got to. It was a pretty traumatic head spin moment for me. Tracy, your starting weight is 109.8 kilos. My name's Tracy Moores. I was on the first episode of Australian Biggest Loser. She's a whirlwind. She's a whirlwind. She's 100 mile an hour, non-stop on the go all the time. But probably Australia's original plus size model. So being a big girl was what I made my money on. I didn't know anything about the show. I thought to myself, okay, what's this all about? Didn't research it, no, no nothing. I was laying in bed one night and um, my partner said to me, oh, you should, you should really go for that. And then my agency said something to me. And um, so that was why I decided. So it was very flippant. And I had two kids and I thought, you know, I'm getting older, This is it's time to change my life. I thought it'd, it's, uh, it'd be like, you know, a bit of a holiday and you really exercise, you eat, you da 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 da. 
and it'd be a, a bit of fun. Of course it wasn't. We have a responsibility to viewers to make sure that the content that we provide is interesting content. If people are sitting around and doing nothing, you would give them some sort of challenge uh, that either brings them together or sets them apart. It's Big Brother and Survivor for fat, fat people. One of the first episodes was this room that we were all in and we were all blindfolded and they took the curtain down and there was all this food and they basically made us out to look like a bunch of pigs and I was quite distraught about the whole thing. We were quite traumatised to the point where I was crying. Watch and learn. <laughs> I can't sit across from him eating like that. I just can't do it. So being back in a gym, how, how are you feeling? What sort of memories does this bring back? I have to say being on a treadmill for hours on, on end, at least two and a half, three hours some, sometimes, um, you know, uh, basically sit and forget. We all were on 500 calories a day. Some actually chose to be less. Fed on caffeine pills, left on a treadmill for hours on end. Some of the contestants, they had enemas, they, you know, shaved all the hair off their body, they didn't eat, they look like the walking dead. And when you're doing that kind of ex exercise, it does take its toll. Um, on New Year's Eve, I was put on a drip due to um, dehydration. So um, that was pretty intense as well. They haven't got a phone. They're totally isolated from everything outside, you know? And I think, they sort of uh, get into their minds somehow or other and uh, that's why they're being manipulated so easily, I reckon. I think there's a really fine balance between looking after people and getting ratings. And it's something as a producer, it's a tightrope you walk constantly. What was the most gruelling challenge that you experienced on the show? We were on a tarmac and we had to pull a plane and I think it was like 40 something degrees and we looked over and we were all standing in the sun and um, we were given hot, hot water at this stage and the crew were all under umbrellas with um, bottles of water with ice and I actually went over to said, can we get some cold water, you know? And they said, no, your water's over there. I watched it, I watched it, but I didn't like what I was seeing. I could see what they were doing you know what I mean? The manipulation of everything. Because she is, can be outspoken, I think they found her to be, uh, let's put her under the bus. She's one we can put under the bus, make her look like the evil one. And she's really not like that at all. It is manip manipulated. They do know who want, they want to win, you know. The more drama, the more air, air time. The teams are set a momentous challenge. I was thinking I was ever going to faint or drop dead. This is joking me! And red and blue teams go head to head at their first weigh-in. I'm very honest with people, I say, so this is the way it's going to work. At the beginning, we'll all love each other. In the middle, you'll hate us because you'll think we're trying to manipulate you. And actually, we're just tired and we're not very good at this. And we'll hate you a little bit too. And we'll feel that you're taking advantage of us and you'll feel the same about us. She called me once and said, get me out of here. She said, come and get me. I've had enough of this rubbish. I was told that I'd signed my life away and um, I was contractually um, bound to stay. Because they sign these things, they're sort of screwed in a way. So what tools do producers use to make the best television? Marion should know. She worked on the show that built the reality TV genre, Big Brother. She knows what it takes to push contestants' buttons. Physicality is very important. You know it yourself. If you go to a hotel room, it looks miserable. We would do things like we would lower the ceilings and turn the lights up and we would make the sofas rubber and they would have cushions that had pricks in them and the colours would be maybe a little bit too bright. People would always say, you know, you give them booze. And you say, actually, no, you don't want people drunk because you don't want to watch people who are drunk. But what we would sometimes do is give them sugar. And then in an hour's time, everyone would be, ah! But yeah, if you have interesting people, they'll do your job for you if you've cast the right people and you've put them in the right situations. I went into researching my PhD about reality TV contestants 
in the hope that it would be quite a positive story. But the reality, the reality was that for most people, it was a bit of a disappointment. From the point of view of producers, the people are there as talent. They're there to make the show entertaining. Whereas for the contestants, the reason they go on the show is not just to create a good show. They're on there to change their life in some way. I never saw a side to David other than a really good side. He was extremely pleasant, funny, great banter. David was a very successful model, one of our top boys, consistently for 10 years. He modelled in New York, in Milan, uh, in Asia, Korea, Japan, and we as agents loved him as well. When David came to us to ask us what we thought about his appearance on The Bachelorette, we were very clear with him that we thought it was not a good idea. The show actually emailed me and they said that you can apply and I was in LA with my friends and they were like, yeah, yeah, just do it as a joke. I thought to myself, okay, this is an opportunity to explore something totally different. It's TV. Um, maybe that's something I might be able to get into in the future. Our counsel to him, our guidance to him was don't do it. Please don't do it. We may have even begged a little bit. <laughs> when we got, went to, into the interview process, they were like, so what do you do, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, I'm a model. And they're like, so have you worked overseas? And I was like, yes, I have. And they're like, so would you say that you're an international model? I was like, yeah. I guess I'm an international model. That's where it all started and that's where it all continued from. So they edited it to make it look like, hi, I'm David and I'm an international model, you know. My name's David, I'm 31 years old and yes, I am an international model. He went from hero to villain, really. Overnight. I was literally sitting there with my family and I was like, no. No. Oh my God. It was like watching a, a slow moving car accident. I was like, no, what? It was worse than I thought. Everyone was like, literally, David, that's not you. David, that is not you. Like my little sister was just like almost crying and I was like, this is the beginning of the end. You just don't understand the extent of what they can do. It's a really tough gig being a contestant on a reality show because you have a mirror right here and you're seeing yourself behaving sometimes in a way that you don't like. And that's confronting. If you're not drunk, I can't show you drunk. If you're not kissing someone, I can't show you kissing. I can only show what you do. The producers are your best friends in the whole entire world you know, um, and at least they make you think that. There's so much pressure on people to deliver ratings that it's like a little weight that you carry around constantly. And yeah, I think that's really hard. The thing about reality TV is the show comes first. And you know, producers might tell you something different, but the fact is they need to create something that people are going to watch. Your balance between being a producer and a person is difficult. I did put a lot of my trust in those producers throughout my time there um, and I think that that was where I went wrong. How much of David Whitco do you think that Australia saw? One percent. Like absolutely nothing. Let's take a look at your final episode. Mm -hmm. David, you didn't receive a rose. I'm afraid that means you'll be leaving us tonight. So this is already five hours of waiting there. I'm actually reasonably happy not to receive a rose tonight. I think you... Uh, misinterpreted the whole situation. I think he judged a little bit too quickly. I think you actually made a mountain out of a molehill. Thank you so much, it's been a pleasure.
jackass. Watching this now, David, I'm thinking you're you're an asshole. Like, how is that all editing? Yeah, the reactions were from different moments throughout that night, and then when I left, I actually walked back and hugged every single guy. And people were like, oh, I can't believe you're leaving, whatever else, blah, blah, blah. They cut that whole thing out as well. So at the end of the day, they got a really good kind of top-notch feeling. Work stopped immediately. Mm. Immediately. Uh-uh, not him. That would be the response. It was, it was harsh. So, oh, that guy from The Bachelorette, no. Yeah, it was over. You know when you kind of, like, walk down the street and you can just hear people whispering, like... It was just constant, like, TV, newspapers, social media, memes, you know, people comparing me to anything that was horrible. Literally people going to town, like, you're an absolute C-word, you are this, go kill yourself. It was just a snowball effect into me just kind of having what would be somewhat of a mental breakdown. Stuff like that is really upsetting. So you think, I don't want you to feel sad. I don't want you to feel that you can't go on social media, that you're embarrassed to go out. So yeah, it's, it's really hard. But I think when you start a show as a boss, you have a responsibility to tell your team that there are guidelines in behaviour and the people need to feel safe and looked after. People who went on talent shows probably enjoyed the actual experience of being on the show a lot more, but then, again, it's the disposability at the end of it. The only thing I know about the music industry at that point is rock and rollers are cool and I'm on a TV show and I'm, you know, I'm getting to do this big thing. Baby, it's a matter. Anyone can see the sign. I caught you. How much would it mean if he gets through? That's his life. Uh, Reese wasn't just a good singer. He had the, you know, the personality, the backstory. You know, when he sang the first time we ever heard him, we kind of like, that man's in the final. He has to be. He's just, wow, blown away. The winner of the X Factor 2011 is... Oh, I was just right in the wave. I definitely didn't feel like I was in the driver's seat. I did feel like, um, not that I got pushed around, but I was coerced very easily, you know. It's it, because they just want to control you. They just want to make you something. You're being told what to do, whether or not you know it. It's like being in a K-pop band or something. You know, you don't control how you cut your hair. You don't control the music you do. You're just a, um, a product created by this bigger industry. I was just a pop star. You'll do what they tell you when they tell you, and uh, they'll take a major percentage of anything you earn. I actually did one record, the last record I did, I was, I was so embarrassed by, like, I actually felt sick. They sold the dream, they're signed up into contracts, and they've got to follow it. And, and the show doesn't always follow you. I mean, as soon as you start dropping sales or dropping numbers, they move on pretty quick. I was just so lonely, and I felt like, I felt like everybody had got something out of it bar me. You know, like, I was just like a stray dog. I felt like I just got like, kind of chucked to the side. I was broken, I was done. I got down to 54 kilos, and that's when my, my, my mum really started to freak out. So many people told me that, oh, I just didn't want to leave the house for two years. A lot of people really suffered, like, clinical kind of depression post-reality TV for lots of different reasons. You know, being depressed is just kind of a side effect of that experience, and it lasts a couple of years for a lot of contestants. It literally like made me like not be able to speak. Like I was like, like trying to answer questions and no words coming out because of trauma. Yeah, like just mental stress and I think. And I think that he was just sort of left flailing. She was getting these idiots uh, sending, I want to kill your children, I hate you. 
none of us were supported, to be honest. Um, we weren't supported on the show afterwards at all. I always said that I thought that one day someone was going to die on that show. In Britain, three people have died after being on reality TV. So the UK government has launched an inquiry into the industry, focusing on the support offered to contestants during and after filming. Former participants on the now axed Jeremy Carl show were among the first to give evidence. I could never get rid of this sort of weight of the Jeremy Kyle around my shoulders. And so I just felt like I was in like a nightmare of a movie. And I just thought, you know what, and I still feel like it's now. And I, I just think, you know what, I wish I could die. There is no aftercare. Yeah. It does not exist. So what are we doing to protect contestants here? The production companies that make some of Australia's most popular reality shows told us they take participant safety very seriously and that they offer psychological support for participants throughout filming, broadcast and after the show goes to air. Psychologists on reality TV shows are the most important people on the team. On Big Brother, we said to people, you can call the psych any time in the next you know, five years if you want to. I can only say what reality TV contestants have told me and they all said that they either didn't feel that they had enough access to a psychologist or that the psychologist was working on behalf of the show and their agenda was really about doing what they needed to for the sake of the show rather than for the contestants themselves. I literally called up the producers and I was like, guys, I'm in a very, very bad position. Like, I'm having really not nice thoughts. I literally begged them for some kind of support and they offered me 10 sessions with a psychologist. I walked in there and I'm like, okay, so I've literally lost my whole career. He's like, okay, cool, no worries. And I'm like, yeah, but you don't understand, I've got nothing to do now. Like, I don't know what to do. And he's like, have you ever thought about mystery shopping? Reese Maston paid for his own psychologist. I've done therapy now for uh, like five years because it, it did get to a point when I, I finally, um, I stopped working and I had nothing, like I didn't have anything. It took me maybe another two or three years to start meeting people and, and working on my own career again to start maybe building those blocks back up. I, uh, I was on the X Factor about eight years ago. I've put a ton of uh, rock records out. Like I said, I'm a musician. I'm going to indulge in some of my own songs if that's OK. <laughs> if I didn't go on the X Factor, would I have pushed my music, you know, as hard as, as I, um, I do now? I, d I don't really know. I'd, I'd, I'd like to hope that I would, but... Um, yeah, if, if we go down to bare facts on reality, I probably would have been a sparky with my dad and, and it wouldn't have been the worst life, but you know, I'll, I'm, I'll take this for the moment, I think. I'm much, much, much better than what I used to be back then um, because I have very supportive people around me now and I'm quite happy in my job now and it's totally different to what I was doing in the past. To be honest with you, I don't think that I'll ever be the same as I ever was. I'm still not 100%, I still get stressed out and you know, even just doing this interview like with cameras on me makes me feel really anxious. The line that everybody used when I interviewed them really rings true that there's no reality in reality TV. I think we need to be smarter in how we make reality TV shows for the people in front of the camera and the people behind the camera. Because I think when we started, we were very innocent and none of us really got it. And I think the more we make, the more we realise, actually, you know, it is life changing. That piece was produced by Michelle Rimmer and shot by Dean Brochet. I, I mean, I feel bad now for watching reality TV and yeah. kind of laughing along and being like, ha ha. Yeah. Um, we do love to hate the villains though, don't we? There's a darker side to it, I suppose. Would you still, would you, would you want to be on one of those shows? No way after watching that. I used to want to be on The Amazing Race and Survivor, but I don't think I could escape the manipulation. What about no. you? Oh, I'd be the manipulator. So, <laughs> um, well, so you think. I think Amazing Race would be so fun to be on, but now I'm thinking maybe it isn't fun. Yeah, this is how they get you. Damn.